So I'm just going to sum up very, very, very quickly um, some of uh, what's amazing, and of course makes perfect sense once you know it, but it's something that you never really think about. So animals get pretty much every disease, correct me if I'm wrong, that we get, diabetes, heart disease, uh, cancer, gout, um, <laughs> uh, depression, eating disorders, self-injury, STDs, substance abuse, and the idea of Zubiquity is why aren't we speaking to people who care for animals so that we can all take better care of one another? Would that, would that sum it up? Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, it's exactly. So I, uh, you know, I'm a human cardiologist. I, I, 10 years ago, I was happily taking care of heart attacks and atrial fibrillation and high cholesterol on human beings. And then I had this uh, really great opportunity. One of the veterinarians from our local Los Angeles Zoo asked if I would come and do some imaging of some of their animals' hearts. And while I was there doing these things, I was listening to the veterinarians talk about uh, congestive heart failure in a kangaroo or you know, leukemia in a rhinoceros or you know, infertility in a cheetah. And, um, and it, it really hit me that I, although I had been you know, on faculty almost 20 years, I, in a human hospital, I knew so little about animal health and disease, and I knew almost nothing about veterinary education. So that was the beginning. And we, when Catherine and I started this project, we, the, the overarching concept was what if physicians and healthcare providers to humans thought about the human patient as the human animal patient and sort of took the veterinary approach. Well, and, and another thing that I found absolutely fascinating from the book was that it turns out that 100 years ago, we were all taken care of by the same people. There was definitely a, more of an overlap in the professions 100 or so years ago when there were more animals in our daily lives, whether they were work animals or we were sort of living in more rural communities. But with increasing urbanization, uh, the academic medical centers that took care of humans tended to migrate towards cities. and the doctors that took care of animals tended to migrate out toward um, rural areas, and the separation kind of became entrenched that way. And there's also a cultural totally. divide, too, that um, Barbara has more experience with than I do directly, but I've observed it as we've talked to lots of veterinarians and other people taking care of animals, that there's a little bit of sometimes tension between the fields. Well, egos, big yeah. egos, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah, we, we have heard sort of somewhat snarky jokes on both sides. Um, one of the the things that, you know, veterinarians for the most part, first of all, there are, I should say that zoos and aquariums in North America are staffed by highly qualified board certified veterinarians who take outstanding care of their patients. And on occasion, they reach into the human community for help. So I just happened to be in the right place at the right time. I was one of the lucky uh, docs who got to do that. But um, the veterinarians that we know, for example, who work in zoos and aquariums, they take care of pediatric patients, adolescent patients, geriatric patients. They do surgery, internal medicine. They need to know cardiology, rheumatology. I mean, it's, it's very different from what, what I do at UCLA, which is <laughs> kind of narrow. And but it's also curtain. on fish and reptiles and birds and mammals. Right. So <laughs> which, I, love, which, I love the joke. There's a joke that they have in the book that veterinari what do veterinarians call physicians? No, it's, it's, I think we, it's what, it, what do you call the veterinarian, this is out of a yeah. veterinarian's voice, what do, what do you call a veterinarian who only knows how to take care of one species? Oh. A physician. A physician. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. So what was the, um, the case that you, well, I'm jumping around a little bit, but one of the most amazing examples of the ubiquitous concept, I guess I'll call it, actually is at the end of the book, has to do with Tracy McNamara and something that started in 1999. And I'm wondering if you could tell that story, because I think it's such a, everything, everybody mm -hmm. can understand how much impact mm -hmm. it can have on our lives sure. if, if, if people take this approach. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in 1999, um, there was a veterinarian working in the Bronx Zoo, and she lives in Queens, and she noticed that there were crows dropping dead all over, like falling out of the sky and stumbling around on the sidewalk. And at the same time, she started noticing that her, um, some of the exotic birds under her care at the zoo, a cormorant, an eagle, some of the flamingos, were also getting sick. And um, a third prong of the puzzle was happening that she didn't know about yet, which was that human patients were coming into hospitals with um, 
similar symptoms. They were getting sick, stumbling around, and in some cases were dying. And what ended up happening was that she, she knew something was killing those birds, but she didn't know quite what. The CDC eventually came up and did an investigation and declared triumphantly that it was St. Louis encephalitis. And um, they did a mosquito abatement program because that's carried by mosquitoes. Uh, but Tracy McNamara, Dr. McNamara, knew that it couldn't be St. Louis encephalitis because St. Louis encephalitis doesn't kill birds. Birds are the carriers and the virus passes through them, but ah. they don't die. So, that, so this veterinary knowledge that she had, she knew it had to be something different. So she called up the CDC. She said, I have barrels of dead birds. Would you like to take a look at them and let's figure out what this is together? They slammed the door on her, said, no, thank you. We deal with humans. You can keep your animal information over there. And she kept pushing and pushing and eventually went to uh, an army lab um, in Fort Detrick. And uh, they together figured out that it was West Nile virus. And it was the debut of West Nile virus on North American shores. It had never been seen here before. And since then, it's you know, traveled across the continent and reemerges every year with the, each crop of hungry mosquitoes. Uh, yeah, that, that's amazing. Um, and and she, she tried. She knocked at the door. She did. Many times. Yes, and this is one of those areas where, um, you know, we really call for vets and human doctors to work together because uh, you can enhance the knowledge on both sides. And one of the things that she comments on, because we asked her explicitly, did, do you think that they were not interested in you because you were, you know, just a vet? And she, she goes there, and she, yeah, she felt that there was real condescension and a, a real lack of awareness of what the knowledge that she had, what scientific knowledge she had. And she's a DVM PhD. I mean, she, she had a lot of knowledge. So, um, and there is this uh, weird hierarchy, unfortunate hierarchy in human medicine, uh, where sort of a self-created pyramid where MDs sit at the top and all doctors that aren't MDs sort of, you know, the, the, the PhDs, the dentists, the <laughs> psychotherapists, and, um, and, and by the way, within the MD community, yeah. there's also- Surgeons. Right, yeah. there's lots and lots of hierarchies. Um, but I remember when I, I was- I hope a, there are no surgeons here. <laughs> when I was a fourth, year, a fourth year medical student, there are probably some physicians here um, or medical students. When you're in your fourth year, you have to decide, you know, what you're gonna finally be. And like a lot of medical students, I liked everything, and I, had, I narrowed it down to internal medicine, psychiatry, and pediatrics. And so I was asking the residents who were my supervisors, what should I do? And I remember this one surgical resident who was probably like 27 years old, so you know, I thought he, he was you know, older, so he would know. And he said, um, pediatrics, why would you go into veterinary medicine? Oh. And oh. he was trying to take down peds because Ouch. the patients can't talk. But you know, decades later, thinking about that, was really uh, wow. interesting. Wow. Um, another, another story that you tell in the book is about, um, and I love the story, the little uh, tamarind, Spitzbuden. Mm -hmm. um, and I, that, it sounds like that was like an awakening uh, moment for you in terms of your thought processes about animals and people. And I'm wondering if you can tell that story. Right, so um, early on, uh, when I was first going to the zoo, they called me one day because a number of their tamarind, so tamarind are these little Central and South American monkeys. They live at the top of the canopy of the rainforest. And the LA Zoo had a large collection of them, and a number of them were developing heart failure, and then some of them were dying suddenly. And they were, the zoo was concerned about what this might be. Is there an infectious problem? Um, could this be some toxin that they didn't know about? Is it a genetic issue? So they asked if I'd come to the zoo and do cardiac ultrasounds, echocardiography, on each one of them. And if we could identify an animal that had an early stage heart failure, we would treat them with ACE inhibitors and beta blockers, same things we would give human patients. So the first day that I'm there, there's a little tiny monkey. Her name is Spitzbuben. And they have her in a little box. And they're um, giving her an, inhalation, an inhalational agent to make her go to sleep for the procedure. And I walked up close to her, because she's, they're adorable. I mean, oh, I they are, they have huge eyes, it's, right? Yeah. And this particular kind had those, that wispy little mustache, Aww. and they're like this big. Aww. So like as an impulse, because it's a beautiful animal, and because as a doctor, when you're with a patient, particularly a pediatric patient, you come close, you try to engage, create a trust bond. So I came close, and I made good eye contact. And as I thought I was maybe making the connection, because she was staring back. <laughs> The vet put his hand on my shoulder and said, please don't do that. Stop making eye contact. You're frightening her. You're terrifying her. You're going to give her capture myopathy. So I did what I was told. Um, and I thought, okay, myopathy, again, it means a disease of the muscle. There are lots of myopathies in human medicine, but capture myopathy, never heard of. So I get home, and I start researching, Googling. And 
I learned that there's a syndrome uh, that, by the way, has been in the veterinary literature for decades, many, many decades, that animals, many kinds of animals, from shorebirds like flamingos to hoofed animals like zebras and okapi and deer um, to rabbits, when they're terrified, when they're being chased by a predator or restrained, they, uh, they can have this syndrome that can cause sudden cardiac death. So they're like frightened to death. Exactly. Their heart can't take it. Exactly. I mean, the, are they like flooded with adrenaline? They or? are. They're of their fleet. It's one. This is one part of a larger syndrome. But yeah, there's this. Their bodies fill with adrenaline, and the adrenaline poisons, in essence, the muscles, the muscles. and it, the heart muscle can be poisoned. So, as I'm reading this, it, it, I have this uh, kind of like, oh my God, this is the same thing as a quote unquote new human diagnosis. Around the year, around 2000 or so, a new diagnosis sort of um, came into the human community. I mean, we started talking about something called uh, Takatsubo cardiomyopathy. And this was, uh, this is a Japanese term because it was coined by some Japanese cardiologists. But in essence, it's a syndrome when human patients who've experienced either intense grief or fear, uh, people who see a loved one die, um, or it's been reported when someone was left at the altar. Or oh. they lose their life savings with the roll of the dice. That these in intensive experiences flood the body with adrenaline and can cause this acute kind of heart failure that sometimes, not usually, but sometimes can cause death. So as I'm reading and thinking about capture myopathy and then thinking about Takotsubo cardiomyopathy, I realize that these are overlapping, if not identical, syndromes, but that you know, the human medical community was a really big deal in the year 2000, this new, newly identified syndrome. And so new. vets had been talking about it, and not only talking about it, thinking about ways of treating it, and more importantly, preventing it, since at least the 1970s. And oh. that was an aha moment. And, and then, I'm skipping ahead, but I know they're related. It comes back to human care, uh, because a few steps down the road, it informs us, it possibly informs us about sudden infant death syndrome, doesn't it? There's a link, a couple steps down. Yeah, I mean, one of the things we tried to do was to look at human physiology and look at where it overlaps with animal physiology. And, you know, we, we generated hypotheses in this book. We didn't do prospective clinical trials to prove anything. Right. The, the idea with Zubiquity is to say, if it's not a good idea for physicians to be siloed and, only, and to have no animal knowledge. So we would say it's important for a cardiologist or a pediatric cardiologist to know that when some mammals are placed supine, lying down, the, the lying down, face down, face down, face down. That, that, can that can cause the heart to slow. And that loud noises for many juvenile mammals, like fawn, like deer, you know, juvenile deer, further slows the heart. And that restraint uh, also can, can sometimes- Like swaddling. Like, over swaddling. Over swaddling. So okay. we're, we're not trying to be prescriptive, right. but we're kind of creating these informational bridges that, hey, you know what? We don't know if this truly connects to SIDS, but we think it's a good idea for pediatric cardiologists to be aware of this animal physiology. And then that's, so we created a hypothesis about SIDS. Wow. That's, that is fascinating. Um, so generally speaking, um, there's, uh, well, okay, let's just talk about cancer for a second. Um, so it turns out that cancer was found in the brain of dinosaurs, or a dinosaur, right? So that's how long cancer has been on this earth. We think of it, you know, as being something, something oh, that in the 60s, 70s, 80s. Right. Yeah, so modern or so something. So modern. modern. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, you point out in the book that, um, in the animal world, there's so many things that we can point to in various kinds of cancers. For instance, um, cows, dairy cows that are constantly lactating don't get breast cancer. Mm -hmm. You know, what can that tell us about women um, mm -hmm. and their hormone levels and that right. have to do with lactate? Vet, or that, vets call those cows professional lactators. By oh, the way. really? Yeah, they, they <laughs> lactate for a living. <laughs> hmm, I wonder what that says about. Can we do that? No, never mind. Um, uh, and, then, and then you've got, uh, I mean, these, I'm jumping around, but I just think it's so fascinating that it turns out that certain cancers in dogs 
follow pathways much more similar to cancers in humans than mice, mm -hmm. uh, which is where all the experimenting is done. Not that we should experiment on dogs, mm -hmm. as you point out in the book, but, um, but where are we and how much is informing, how much of the animal world is informing our world when it comes to cancer? And what is comparative oncology and what is it telling us? And yeah, I mean, the, the, the first thing to say is that there's a, a block that some on the human side have about thinking about what I'm going to call spontaneously occurring disease, spontaneously occurring cancer in animals. Um, there's a tendency sometimes to keep thinking that we're talking about laboratory animal, where we give an animal, uh, particularly rodent models, uh, the disorder. The fact is, everywhere around us, whether it's in our homes or in the wild or in the oceans or birds, animals spontaneously, like us, get diseases of all kinds, right? right? Some will be born with congenital heart disease. Uh, some will attract, you know, acquire a virus and a respiratory infection and pneumonia. Some will fall and have a long bone fracture or a bleeding. In the, I mean, it is all happening. And one of the disorders that can happen, whether in the wild or in our homes, is cancer. And uh, probably, this is a big crowd, and canine cancer is very common. And, and so is feline cancer. And um, mm -hmm. there are two particular kinds of cancers that are, are notorious in dogs. One is osteosarcoma, which is a bone cancer that affects large breed dogs, um, labs, Bernese mountain dogs. Um, the, the larger dogs typically are susceptible. And, um, and the other, and, and osteosarcoma, by the way, affects human beings, typically adolescents. So it's common in dogs, large breed dogs, not common in humans, but it affects adolescents and, and taller. So maybe something during the growth? Something phase. one of the theories. One, and melanoma, by the way, canine melanoma also is a, a common dog killer. So um, what's interesting is that the biology of those cancers in dogs and in humans is very similar. Of course, the lifespan of a dog is shorter uh, than a human. But it's longer than a rodent. It's longer. And, and in a rodent model, we're typically giving the animal that disorder. Whereas it's naturally it's, occurring in the canine. Yes, exactly. I feel like we have to say again that we're not talking about researching on dogs. These are people who bring their pet dogs who sadly have gotten cancer um, to their veterinarian and then they participate in trials that way. Got so these, these would be animals with intact immune systems and they're living in environments that are very similar to ours. So in a lot of ways, they're actually better models for studying how these cancers work than, um, than some mouse in a lab that's been given that cancer. And so the National Cancer Institutes and other organizations now have developed these, what are called comparative oncology consortia. So they're groups of veterinary oncologists and human oncologists who are together trying to uh, advance understanding about these shared cancers. And the, the concept is that the benefits will ultimately be bi-directional. And uh, we're really, it's, it's, it's heating up um, in, in the area of melanoma and osteosarcoma, but also lymphoma and some other cancers. And also, animals uh, can warn us about certain cancers mm -hmm. that might be heading our way, right? Because there are a little bit of canaries in the coal mine mm -hmm. for us. Yeah, breast cancer is a great example. So back um, about 20 years ago or so, there was a die-off of beluga whales. So, so breast cancer, of course, can every mammal, by definition, has breasts. And breast cancer has been found in pretty much every mammal um, in whom it's been looked for. And there are certain mammals where you see more of it, like big cats, lions, and tigers, and jaguars. But even beluga whales have um, been diagnosed with cancer. So there was a die-off of belugas up in the St. Lawrence Estuary in Canada. And they had breast, um, some adenocarcinoma of the colon. Uh, there were a number of adrenal malignancies that the, these, these uh, whales had. But a parallel epidemic of breast cancer was noted in the women who were living on the shore there. And so in that uh, example, ultimately there was an aluminum smelting facility, and the ultimate conclusion was that there was contamination uh, that had probably triggered both of the uh, problems, both species. Hmm. Um, and now, I, I don't know if you can tell us the story, but I found this story fascinating about um, kind of the origin of this cancer drug, Oncept. Mm. Can you tell us that story? Yeah, this was a collaboration that happened between a oncologist at Sloan Kettering, an oncologist at, he was at the time at the Animal Medical Center in New York, and um, 
they, they met when this veterinarian went to dinner at the Princeton Club with this group of physicians. Uh, so, and he, he told us that he felt a little bit of that kind of, he didn't feel condescension necessarily from them, but he said he felt a bit like, a, I don't know, like he was undercover or a fraud as he was there <laughs> with these human physicians. But this um, august human oncologist turned to him at some point during the meal and said, do dogs get melanoma? And Phil Bergman is the name of the veterinarian. He happened to be the leading, probably the world's expert on canine melanoma. And he said, why, yes, in fact, they do. And so the two of them started a collaboration that ended up leading to a, an injectable melanoma treatment for dogs that is now, they're working on making it work for human beings also. Um, so, so yeah, cool. and that, that's, it. that's really what, I mean, there's a lot of things that we hope will come out of Zubiquity, and I, I come at this from the non-physician, non-veterinarian side, so as a patient and a parent and just sort of a curious person, yeah. I love making these connections and seeing myself as a human being and p as you know, part of this wider network of life on this planet. Oh, um, sure. So not to get too philosophical, but, um, uh, but these kinds of collaborations also specifically are what we hope comes out of Zubiquity, whether it's in the area of cancer, heart disease, um, obesity and nutrition, uh, and even some of the behavioral issues that, we, that you alluded to. Speaking of which, <laughs> um, so uh, it turns out, just shockingly, um, that there's a whole slew of behaviors that we consider, well, we now consider largely biological with a psychological component, um, substance abuse, you know, there, um, there are a lot of very funny examples. I mean, it's not funny, but it's kind of funny. Uh, examples in the book of these, you know, wallabies who are oh, eating poppies and, yeah. yeah, who are eating these poppies and getting stoned and these birds that are eating these berries oh. and getting drunk and, um, uh, you know, this spaniel who likes to lick a toad who has this toxin, not toxin, but a, some kind of yeah, hallucinogen. Hallucinogen <laughs> on it, just naturally occurring in its skin, and this dog loves to lick the hallucinogen off the back of a toad. Um, and that poor dog, I guess, liked it so much that it really impacted its owner's lives. They found themselves at three in the morning going out to search for these toads so that their dog, Lady, could um, get her fix and they could go back to bed. Well, I wonder if it, she, she was like probably addicted. She was. Exactly, no, she, she was. was. And, it, and neighbors were afraid to have their dogs come over and mm -hmm. play with Lady because they didn't want to, them to learn the behavior. And, uh, <laughs> we, we, by the way, I have to say, when, when we started this project, our intention was to only cover medical illnesses. And, and sort of physiology, right? Physical body. Right. So we had this, uh, our, kind of our, our rubric was, do animals get? And we looked for, we said, do animals get breast cancer, prostate cancer, atrial fibrillation, gout, Crohn's disease, you right. know, STDs. And the answer was resoundingly yes. All yes. When it came to behavioral things, we were very skeptical. And we, and we even talked about not covering them lest the credibility, the scientific credibility of our book sure. be affected. Uh, but we started learning and asking questions of very prominent veterinarians and wildlife biologists, and we learned that it was real. And this um, intoxication issue is seen across many species from, from lady to um, the bird that you're seeing here is a waxwing bird. And waxwings are notorious for seeking out preferentially the fermented berries of this of the pepper tree. And when they find the fermented berries, they will, some of them will gorge on them. And then, um, then they fly erratically, and they they call it flying in, while intoxicated, and, <laughs> which the animal is, version of a DUI. But the the problem is, and it goes from you know, and and again in a parallel, it goes from sort of funny, sort of to sort of not to tragic because whoopsie, that's not what it is. But um, we're getting sorry. to those. There we go. But. Um, this actually was a, a group of, this picture was given to us by um, a, a, vet, a public health veterinarian in LA County, and this was a group of waxwings who had become intoxicated, had flown into a building, and actually, um, this is a little gory, but it's the necropsy, and you can see, oh gosh. I, oh, I don't guess know if we, we have Oh, we didn't put slide, it in. Yeah. But the, the birds, they gorge so uh, completely that the boozy berries were found all the way down their throats. Yeah, mm -hmm. and in their stomachs. Yeah, yeah they're exactly. just like just a huge drive. Huge, yeah. yeah. So we don't have time to talk about all of these, um, but if you saw some slides, there's self injury um, from birds that overpluck their own feathers, um, kind of comparing to cutters, mm -hmm. or um, 
you know, uh, which sort of is stemming from some over grooming, you know, which sends, who knew that grooming sends endorphins? <laughs> but I think if you have a teenage daughter, you know that already. <laughs> um, but if we talk about the, these kinds of behavioral, semi-behavioral based things, is there something that th those um, sciences are, are telling us about our own behaviors and mm -hmm. how to treat addictive kinds of mm -hmm. kinds of problems that we have. Yeah, I, th I think I, mean, just, I think there's a there's a scientific and medical takeaway. There are scientific and medical takeaways, and then there are these kind of cultural, philosophical, and humanistic takeaways. Um, and to start with the cultural and philosophical Please. humanistic ones. So if you think about mental illness in, in general, um, so one in four of us, and that's a conservative number, will have some major mental illness in the course of our lives. And this is from our children to elderly. Remember, we're talking about depression, bipolar disorder, anxiety, dementia, ADHD. Um, you know, it, it, it's, right. it's a huge, uh, huge issue. But it is, continues to be, despite what we know, highly stigmatized. Absolutely. Uh, people are secret about, secretive about it. There's uh, self-recrimination and- Coverage, healthcare cover I mean, coverage. Coverage, uh, perfect insurance example. Insurance coverage, yeah. perfect. not so great. And it keeps people from seeking care. So. Absolutely. So um, when it was national, it was, the, uh, it was Mental Illness Awareness Week about a month ago or so. And one of the things you may have seen was the fight stigma, uh, the, the stigma with the big red thing across it. So as we were going through this project and we were learning that you know, uh, many species of animals, for example, self-injure. So, so cutting is an example of something which uh, I assumed was uniquely human. It never occurred to me. I didn't know. Uh, but when we Yeah, why, why would an animal injure itself? It seems so anti-evolution. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. But when we presented that question to um, some very, very prominent vets, they, I could see the um, I, they were shocked at the ignorance and the naivete. <laughs> naivete. Um, city girl here, but and many of you probably know that. Yeah, I mean, animals from horses uh, to birds to um, dogs and cats can self-injure in response to certain kinds of experiences. Um, so, so cutting uh, anxiety, anxiety disorder is common in, among certain breeds of dogs more than others. Uh, substance seeking and uh, and many other eating disorders. We learned about uh, all kinds of eating disorders that can happen to animals, and so. We began wondering whether this information would be important for psychiatrists to know about, but, but for patients and for their families to know. Um, it, it might not mean that we have a cure, but they would know that they're, they're not alone. It's context. It's context. And, and maybe that could help um, sort of expand the conversation about stigma. And so we, we, for certain people, friends of mine, family members who've suffered from different kinds of um, issues, um, when I've shared this information, um, it, it comes as a surprise and I think a relief Absolutely. for some of them. Sure. Um, okay, so now <laughs> I just have to change subjects a little bit um, because this might be a relief to some people as well. Uh, who knew that animals get STDs? <laughs> Come on. Um, <laughs> I mean, okay, here, here's a real piece of Chicago trivia that I bet you guys don't know about. Um, our friend Sue, the dinosaur outside of the Field Museum, Trichomonas. <laughs> right? Yes, but probably not sexually caught in her case, but it's the same uh, pathogen <laughs> that over millions of years mutated Do we know into. really <laughs> how she contracted it? Were we there? I, I won't speak for her, good point. <laughs> but you know, when you think about animals, they have multiple partners, usually, and they're not practicing safe sex. So it sort of makes sense that they would be passing yeah. pathogens. And there are these notorious uh, epidemics. Right now there's an epidemic of chlamydia, of you know, sexually transmitted chlamydia, which is a huge human problem, among koalas in Australia. They're oh, actually so threatened, threatened with extinction from chlamydia. They That's are. how serious it there's is. There's a really big yeah. issue. And, oh and um, syphilis is common. If you ask your vet, ask, and maybe some veterinarians here, they know that syphilis is a big issue for rabbits. Um, HPV in dolphins, herpes in baboons. I mean, there's, and, and why wouldn't there be, as Catherine right. said? So, well, and then that's not even taking into account the uh, insane variety of, you know, proclivities that the animal, I mean, you can find not just homosexual, homosexuality and heterosexuality and three ways and incest and rape and, mm -hmm. um, necrophilia. Necrophilia and, 
erectile dysfunction, and I mean, you can find everything that you hear about in the human world in the animal world. It's, it's just not so unusual. I mean, again, the context might make some people feel a little bit better. <laughs> well, as, as, as you're making that, going through that list, and I'm sitting here sort of thinking about how I'm just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I remember when we were going through and doing our research in the beginning, we would say, do you think animals do this? And in, that, in those moments before we knew, we were excited, but there was a kind of a decay curve. As, as the project continued, our excitement, our, you know, was of course we they, yeah. any high animals obsessed with high heels, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know, but uh, it could very well be. Um, we, do have a, we do have a little line on high heels in our, the sexuality chapter of our book. Oh, I mean, you have to look that one up. It's not the chapter's to called Roargasm, and we, um, we, we link the, well, I won't go into it if you don't want to. Oh no! Please. <laughs> um, just there's a there's a certain posture that's seen oh, across species. Oh yes. Across, oh yes. That, we have a we have a slide of it. Um, do, Don't we have the Betty Grable slide? Oh yeah, we do. Isn't that it's, what you're talking it, about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do we? Yeah. I think okay. we do. Um, oh, were you able to? Interrupt? Yeah, no. Okay. Oh, okay. No. Never mind. Okay. Well, yes. There's that famous Betty Grable pinup that most of you might be familiar with, um, where she's kind of turning her behind to the camera, and it's... Back arch. Oh, oh it's the back arch. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's not the, the butt, it's but the it back is, arch. But it's all of a piece. It's all of a piece. Yeah. And it turns out that that posture is a very uh, uh, standard kind of yeah, and animal. It, and it's I'm biologically ready. mediated, yeah. So it, and it's seen in cats and horses and other primates and many, many other animals. It's called lordosis, and it's that lower back sway. And once you tune into it, you'll see it everywhere in advertising, whether it's Katy Perry advertising her new perfume, or you'll see Snooky on the cover of some magazine with, in that sort of lordotic pose. And it's a um, signal, like, I'm sexually it's ready. Sexually receptive. Se sexually receptive, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, now we have to talk about the snarl, too. Just okay. because it's so funny. Oh, we don't have the picture. We don't have the picture, but um, but uh, horses um, and any other animals besides horses? Many others. Many. Yeah, they more. do those uh, lip thing. Very good. You know, like the Elvis Presley lip yeah, thing. Yeah. Good. I can't do it on that side. I can yeah. do it on the other side. I can do it on both. <laughs> and um, and that's another kind of sexual signal, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. And Rolling Stone, Mick Jagger. I mean, right. it's kind of, when you do start looking for it. But when you watch horses doing it, um, they, they, I can't do it the way you can do it. You can demonstrate <laughs> one more time. But it allows them to um, also, from an olfactory perspective, take in the, the sort of Sense. aerosolized molecules of a mare in heat. So they can smell the, the heatness, the, the, the fertility, let's say, of the mares around. So it, it serves a function, but it also is visually very specific. Yeah, it has made its way into the culture as well. Wow. Um, <laughs> uh, okay, so now there's another thing I want to get to. We're going to be taking questions in a few minutes, so if you have some, we'll just have about 10 minutes for that. Um, but before we get to that, another one of the, um, this is actually just a few sentences, but I found it so interesting, I have to pull it out and ask you about it. Um, and this is about, sort of about um, the obesity and eating disorder and metabolizing of different things. Uh, in the research, and it turns out that in mice, they found within their gut flora um, these firmicutes and bacter. Okay, you can help me here. Back, yeah, bacteroidetes. <laughs> and it turns out that um, depending on whether they have more or less of one of these or the other, more or less food is absorbed and thereby they either gain or lose weight. Of course, this jumped out at me because I'm <laughs> always looking for, oh, maybe if I have more vermiculite. <laughs> you know, um, but does that, what was that study all about and what has that informed us? Uh, what has that told us about our own possibilities of avoiding obesity and all that? Um, I'll just say quickly, one thing that this kind of comparative, ubiquitous approach lets us do is take the intense focus off the individual. So although diet and exercise is, of course, really important, uh, this lets us see that a veterinarian would never blame an animal for its diet or exercise. <laughs> if they saw a group of animals um, gaining or losing weight, they would say, what's going on in the environment around that group of animals to make that happen? Mm -hmm. um, so so this, uh, the idea of the microbiome of our gut flora influencing our 
body weight and absorption and, of food and metabolism is um, something that can come out of this kind of comparative approach. I'll let you talk more about the details of that actual study. If I, I can, but what that triggered is, is the sort of the larger question of antibiotics in our environment. And, you know, because veterinarians oh. know, if, if the agricultural veterinarians know that <clears throat> antibiotics used in certain animals will make them gain weight. I mean, it makes them grow faster. So they purposely. They purposely, they, right, in other words, yeah. Because we like big chicken breasts. We like right. big chicken and breasts. And to grow them quickly. Right. Yeah. And less expensively. So if an animal is on uh, an antibiotic, they can, same amount of feed, X dollars, bigger, bigger chicken. So um, one of the, so the point is that veterinarians are aware of the relationship between, because when you give antibiotics to any animal, it changes the flora, the microbiota. So this connection, uh, which everyone's talking about the microbiome now, but veterinarians, again, really led the way here. We're thinking this way uh, long before we were. I mean, people now are talking about fecal transplants a lot on right. the human side. Again, the veterinary side, I'm thinking this way, doing this kind of thing um, long before. So. Hmm. Interesting. But just the idea also that a different makeup of the bacteria in your gut could influence how, how many calories you yeah. absorb versus how many calories you know, your friend absorbs. Another, just I, I can't help myself, but this was one of my favorite things I learned during the research for this book, is that we also have our intestines are not just kind of hoses that sit placidly in our guts. They're actually these dynamic organs that expand and contract in response to a lot of different things, from light to the people around us to different times of the year or the day. And uh, if it's in this kind of contracted, constricted mode, the food passing over it, um, you absorb fewer calories from it because there's less surface area of your intestine exposed oh. to the food. And if it's more relaxed and open, more calories can be absorbed because there's more surface area. So just looking at things like that, and this has been documented in songbirds, in, mm. in snakes, in um, lots of rodents. And they use it seasonally when there's you know, scarcity, to, when they need to bulk oh. up, they can expand the surface area using this smooth muscle mechanism. Um, and like before a migration, for example, the gut will relax, more calories absorbed, pack on more fuel, migrate, and then the gut shrinks back up again. And, and the connection to human health, again, a hypothesis, because we've not tested this, but if you look at smooth muscle, um, you know, we, we also, if you look at the, our intestines, we also have a ribbon of smooth muscle that is functional. So the question is, could there be um, you know, a variable relaxation and contraction um, of, of our absorbing organ that is affected by the drugs that we take, uh, circadian rhythms. I mean, the stress we're under, the mood we're in. Yeah, because there continues to be, even as a physician, you know, I've seen so many overweight and ob obese patients, and we always give the standard lecture about exercise and diet, which is right. appropriate. But you still do see patients who seem to be doing it right and aren't losing the way they should, or right. people they gain much more readily than others. And we don't know why, those, why that's happening. So this is a kind of a hypothesis, just knowing, because as soon as we learn about these dynamic accordion-like in intestines, we're like, well, that's, that's a good hypothesis. I feel like the gut is the next uh, frontier, next frontier. For, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> for medical research, because I'm you know, hearing about mental health related to the gut and all sorts of like mm -hmm. things you would have never mm -hmm. connected before. Um, well, we probably have only time to tackle maybe one or two more things. So I'm picking adolescence um, <laughs> because, you know, we're all parents of adolescence, first of all. Uh, but second of all, I mean, we think of adolescence and the problems that human adolescents have as being uniquely human. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think your research is from the animal world is telling us that not so fast. Um, how, what kind of context can you put that in? Well, there's um, no creature, really, unless it's a complete clone of itself, is born mature. So all animals and even plants and other kinds of animal life have to go through this transition period from being under the care of their parents to becoming parents themselves. So we decided to take a closer look at that period of time and uh, what happens to the animal that might protect them during that time, what gets them through it, and what kinds of things they need to accomplish in that period of time to make them functioning adults. So we found that there are parallels across species in things like risk taking and novelty seeking and um, the need for an animal to understand the things out there that might try to kill it. So if you're a wild animal, let's say a wild 
gazelle, you might uh, do something called predator inspection as an adolescent. So if you're, if you're a young baby gazelle, you're not going to do predator inspection, but as you get older, predator inspection is where you creep up to your predator, main predator, which are cheetahs in the case of these gazelles, and, um, and then just see what happens. If you live <laughs> to tell the tale, you've gotten a really good set of uh, data there. It's just like going into the cafeteria and saying, do you mind if I sit here? <laughs> well, that's, actually, that's very interesting because mm -hmm. that gets at a whole other social group aspect mm -hmm. of it. But this would be, we actually propose in our book that uh, a big kind of lethal presence for teenagers nowadays are cars. And we yeah. spend a lot of effort as human animals educating teens and children about the lethal dangers of cars, whether it's those um, driver's ed videos that we show them and you know, texting and driving and drinking and driving campaigns like that. So. Um, so they kind of inspect their predators in those culturally acceptable ways. And, and you know, I, as we were talking about our adolescence um, before, but so when you're, when you're a parent of a, you know, you go to these things at school and they talk to you about the risks of being an adolescent, and adolescence becomes almost a disease. It's right. become pathologized. Totally. So, I mean, there's even a whole branch of medicine dedicated to adolescence. I mean, yep. the way we talk about, you know, heart, you know, can't cardiologists and oncologists. So it's, it's like a disease. And the problem like is... Pregnancy used to be considered, right? Yes, right? yes. Like a, yes. Like it's a condition. So, and, right. and the problem is the risk-taking. It's the, the underdeveloped prefrontal cortex, right? Again, that term underdeveloped as though it's abnormal. Um, the, you know, the abnormal risk-taking, the abnormal novelty uh, seeking, the sociality. increased yeah, sociality and sensation seeking, all these things which are, you know, p parents wring their hands over it. Well, when you flip it and think about an animal, um, a transitioning animal from a juvenile dependent state to an autonomous adult state, you need to have a neurobiology that drives dispersal, which is basically leaving the natal group and going out in the world, uh, if that's what your animal you know, is going to be doing. You need to have a neurobiology that drives uh, the kind of curiosity and, um, and, and making the animal willing to leave the safety of protection. Behavior follows neurobiology. If you cast it in those terms, then it is incredibly important that the adolescent brain, animal adolescent, whether it's human or otherwise, have the interest in sensation and novelty, is willing to take risks. Um, because without that, it, it, you don't have, it's never it, gonna leave. Right, right. so this offered a kind of a, a flip on that idea that adolescence is actually not a disease, it's this powerful, important, um, rich moment with its own specific neurobiology. And if you actually look at what many, many of the greatest scientists have actually produced their best work when they were adolescents, mathematicians yeah. um, and, and, and others, um, and there's just a way to recast what this brain is about. And, and Yeah, it's so. not just this period to sort of hold your breath and get through, that mm -hmm. there's actually, it has its own uh, e ecology. But, but, but it's, sadly, and this is fascinating to us, uh, so if you look at these actuarial tables of, of adolescence, it is a risky period, right? I mean, adolescents sure. do do crazy things and they get hurt and God forbid sometimes it's tragic. Um, when we looked on the animal side, we learned that uh, it's the same thing is true among these transitioning uh, animals as well. A number of species, their rates of predation are higher. For example, the Thompson gazelles that engage in this predator inspection behavior, they do get picked off more readily. Um, so that risk taking, that, that, that interest in novelty does take a, a toll on them. But again, uh, there's this parallel. On the other end of it, it, it makes them stronger and more autonomous. Well, we're gonna um, take a few questions. I guess the, one of the things we can um, take from our conversation, at least one of the many, is that, you know, uh, put in context, we can say, ah, about a couple of, about a lot of different things, you know, that we think about it in terms of our own health. But um, we have two um, people with microphones. One is right there, and um, one is right here. And we're gonna take, we only have time for about 10 minutes of conversations. Please wait till you have the microphone because we are gonna be recording this. Go ahead. Do, do animals living in a zoo or a human being living in a jail cell have similar emotional issues? So, so everyone heard the question. It's a really interesting and good question. Do animals living in a zoo and humans in a jail cell have similar emotions? Um, so one of the things that we learned about was um, what's happening uh, in North American zoos is, is, is such a 
transition and a, a change from what used to be. The mission now of zoos is conservation and education. And in, at least in the LA Zoo, and I know we were just in, in New York for, at a conference, um, the, there's an effort to make environments you know, very uh, beneficial to animals. Obviously, these are captive animals, but to create positive environments. So one of the things that we know is that any animal, uh, human or otherwise, who is in a bad environment, is enclosed and isolated, can experience, for example, self-injury. Um, if you take prisoners who are in solitary, human prisoners in solitary confinement, the rates of self-injury and really severe kinds of um, like swallowing objects and stuff is very, very high. Isolated animals um, are also at risk for self-injury. It's one of the risk factors for self-injury. So whether it's zoo specifically or isolation, and a horse, for example, a stallion who's kept in a stall without exposure to other horses is also at risk for self-injury. So I don't know if that answers the question. Okay. I am so ex excited for the medical community to catch up with the veterinarians because it seems to me it's always been obvious that animals have emotion and they have not acknowledged that and they're still only slowly acknowledging that. Just recently there was a piece about dogs and, and the emotion of dogs in the New York Times. So frankly, I'm like, thank God, let's hurry up and get there. Um, the, the other thing I, I'm curious about is um, the animals don't seem to have judgment. I mean, they're not judging the animals about STDs or anything like that. So this makes me wonder, have you seen any signs, of, and, and this is gonna be weird, but is there any like signs of religion among animals or belief systems <laughs> that they can't have? That's not where I thought you were going. <laughs> <laughs> that question. Um, we, right, right, right. Um, we haven't looked specifically at that, but where I like to go to, again, from my, um, I'm not a physician, I'm not a veterinarian, I came at this from more of the humanities side. Um, what I see are cyclical things that animals might do in response to the seasons, and for me I can see that as being somehow connected to some of the religious rites that might have grown out of human beings over the course of many, many millions of years of evolution. Um, just to go to the judgment and sort of the shame judgment piece, about six months ago we were invited to, uh, onto a llama farm and we were there on shearing day. Uh, and so all of them were very heavily coated. And the first one came out and was sheared to a nude state. I mean, it, you know, a full shearing. And the, um, the woman who was, owns the farm said, you have to watch what happens when she ends up back with the group. And so we stood there. And this now kind of naked appearing llama ended, went back in. and. All of the llamas went like this. <laughs> and then this. Yeah, and I mean, then can... backed off. And she was, I mean, again, uh, you know, one of the things that I, we talk about in the book, when we all went to school, we were taught not to anthropomorphize. Right. Right? That wasn't scientific. That was, you know. Uh, so one of the points of our book is that since then, like the 1960s, when I was going to school, uh, there have been a few scientific things that have happened. For example, we now know that we share nearly 99% of our genes with the chimpanzee, and like between 40 and 60 with Drosophila. We've had neuroimaging. There's been a lot that we know. So maybe we can ease off on that strong admonition against anthropomorphizing. But having said that, when we watched that llama go in there and them turn around, it was hard to not think that she was ashamed or embarrassed or something. Huh. Um, I should also, I just also want to point out that, um, after, that they'll be signing books and able to answer more questions in, later, but let's take a few I, more. Sure. Um, thank you so much. I can't think of a, a miss today's presentation to sum up you know, what this CHF program you know, is about. Um, I've read a lot of books over the years and given a lot of thought to the, whether it's an important question or not of what makes us somehow as humans different from animals. But there was a book I read, and I don't remember who wrote it, and he talks about that as an introduction. And, and what he came up with as his definition, which has been my favorite for years, is that the humans think about the future. Um, and so getting away from things like morality and emotion and so forth. So pondering that, A, do you have an opinion, any experience with, with what you've done? You know, the, the, the notion of animals thinking about the future, is, is this author wrong when he says that? And do you have any other kinds of things that you would like to sort of say what you think are, if you will, a fundamental difference between the humans and the rest of the animals? Good question. 
I mean, I, so my first thought in terms of um, the future, it depends what you mean by think. Animals develop a legacy. Many animals work on legacy. If you think, for example, of some of the architectural structures that they create, a beaver may create a dam that is sufficiently, is, is built and fortified sufficiently that it may last many generations. There's this um, sort of transgenerational benefit to his children, grandchildren, etc. So is that thinking about the future? One could argue that why, you know, why, uh, invest the calories in doing that unless you're... And, and there's food, food storage. Sometimes granaries serve the same purpose over multiple generations of a single family. What I think you meant was the idea, I mean, you know, like, tomorrow is the future, but so is 10 years Ten, from now. Right. And, and the other interesting thing is, is if you look at animal behavior, one of the most mind-blowing moments for me was learning... I, okay, I thought animals in the wild would eat until satiety and then stop. Okay, I just assumed that. It was very, I assumed it was uniquely human that we would overeat. Um, boy, boy, was I wrong, and the vets kind of gave it to us when we, for being naive about that, but it turns out because scarcity is so common in the wild, there's a hardwired, um, hard wiring to overconsume if you're given access to abundance, which makes sense. So then one could say, well, is, is that future thinking behavior? I mean, it's, it's an ecological behavior um, so from that perspective, from the what's uniquely human, the thing we should point out is it's not that every single disease that humans get, animals get. Every species is unique. That's the definition of a species. And by the way, we humans, we're not uniquely unique. Every species is uniquely unique. So, <laughs> and we... And I actually think that for me, that's, that's the most important thing. It's just recognizing that we are unique in our own way and a meerkat is unique in its own way and that we are all constantly continuing to evolve. So despite this massive overlap that we found, the most common cause of heart disease in the U.S. is what's called coronary artery disease. That's atherosclerosis of the big arteries that are on the outside of the heart that feed blood and oxygen to our heart muscle. That's, we're talking about heart attacks, right? Most, for the most part, no other species gets epicardial coronary artery disease, the, lead, the leading killer. On the other hand, heart disease in general is the leading cause of death among all the great apes. We're one of the great apes, but also gorillas and chimps and orangs and bonobos. So every species is going to have its own unique medical illnesses, but there's just this big overlap. All right, I think we have time for one more question. Now that animals are living such long lives in zoos, uh, is anyone studying dementia among animals? On Saturday, in New York, we had our Zubiquity Conference, and we had physicians and vets from all over the world talking about breast cancer and, and um, Lyme disease and, and anxiety disorder and self-injury. But one of our cases, which was one of the best, was on uh, dementia. And we looked at Alzheimer's disease in humans and something called canine cognitive dysfunction, which they're seeing more and more of in New York City, which has the, the, large, the country's largest population of aging dogs. So as dogs get older, they can develop forgetfulness, uh, confusion, disorientation, and some, and, and, right, exactly. And so there's, there's this um, question of how much, first of all, is, it, uh, is the pathophysiology the same? And there are some suggestions that it's overlapping. And then what's a really interesting question is, what is it about the environments? Because these are dogs living with owners who are getting older that might be contributing to, to Alzheimer's. Wow. All right, well, we have to get moving, um, but thank you all for coming. Thank you.